I appreciate you connecting. It's kind of been a long uh, roundabout way to get together for the first time, although I've known <laughs> uh, a lot longer, but yeah, man. So I don't want to bury the lead, but I want to hear a little bit about you because obviously I've known the company for a while and then only recently got to know your background a little bit through someone I was communicating with. I was checking out the camera and did a review on that and really loved the version too. But to back up here, are you a serial entrepreneur? What's the Ian story? How did you get to where you're at now? I'm successful enough to be able to say this, and but I'm a guy that's failed a lot and I just kept at it. And somewhere in there, I got some resilience. I didn't realize I was as resilient as I was, but if you want to develop resilience, a good way to do it is to try to suction dredge in the Bering Sea for gold. You may not find much gold, but you will become resilient. You got to hear about this. So, well, first of all, where are you at? I'm, I'm in Utah right now. So I'm, I married a gal. Yeah. I've been up in Alaska for all, uh, almost a decade and a half. It's real weird. The concise story that you're looking for. You don't um, have to make it concise. I had, I, I could... I had been accepted to a master's social work program at the University of Utah. I was living down here at the time. And then I just felt like I needed a big adventure. And so I heard about this guy suction dredging up a gnome. It's diving for gold in the Bering Sea. And just, you say that out loud and anybody who has any sort of like hot blood in their veins, your ears prick up and that's a wild adventure. And so I begged, borrowed and stole my way into that opportunity that summer. And I ended up shooting a bunch of footage of the process, like the whole community, the suction dredging community, because we realized really quickly, it's a compelling story to tell. It's this really weird niche industry. That's pretty wild. Lots of weird characters. So we shot footage of that. Anyway, I was supposed to go to grad school as a master social worker in the fall or a candidate. And I just decided I really like Gnome and I, I liked Alaska and I just felt like I needed more seasoning as a human. And so I decided to just stick around. I just followed my gut and I got a job doing social work up there. And then a couple of years later, I started my own uh, gold diving operation. And I deferred that master's. And the reason that was important to the story is years later, I finally circled back. That was my original intention. I wanted to become a therapist. And so I was pursuing that, finishing it in 2020 when COVID hit. And I'm glossing over the uh, last years. We can get back to that. So I'm finishing my master's. The pandemic hits. We switched to remote with people that I was finally in a therapeutic position to help people with. I've been dreaming of this since I was a kid. I was a late teen when I wanted to become a therapist. I knew it. And I just let life get in the way for a long time. So I'm finally in that position of helping people on a very deep level. And it was amazing. And then COVID hits, we switched to remote. And not only what I wanted to do professionally and personally, but the people that I was mo most importantly helping, that rapport that we had, that in-person energy, the work that they had started to do, it just fizzled because of the tech, because we had this view or that view. And we were like looking all over the place. And the operative question that I learned through suction dredging and building boats, and goal diving, just doohickeys and using duct tape and bailing wire was like, what can I control right now in the moment when the waves are kicking up? How can I fix this so we can get a little more time underwater? And that was just a methodology. And I never really thought it applied to the rest of the world, but barely it does. And so I approached that problem from the same lens and it was, what can I control? I wonder if we could find a camera that could change the focal angle and we could have better eye contact. I wonder if that would change the dynamic. And so we went to work and we started where we were, didn't have a lot of budget and have funding or anything. And so when we finally launched on the Kickstarter, we had a, a working prototype that we we're actually using. We had 400 and then all of a sudden the, the chipset shortage hit. So we couldn't fully fulfill the Kickstarter. We had to tell our backers, Hey, we can't buy the previous chip at any price right now. Not sure what we're going to do, but we'll figure it out. And I promise we're not spending your money. Before oh. GM had the same problem, right? Everyone did. Yeah. I got to back up yeah. to the gold thing because I used to watch a show called Gold Rush Alaska. And then there was a show called like Bering Sea Gold or something as well, right? Yeah. So did you watch those? Do those shows hit a little close to home for you? I pitched that show to Discovery. Did you really? So tell me about this. There's certain places that call to certain people. When Alaska is the last frontier, they call it that. But for me, it was almost like a metaphorical quest to a different place. So I knew I wanted to go up there. That was the opportunity that came across my desk. I didn't know about gold diving or any of the stuff that we do up there. I was 30 at the time. So I was well past the Peter Pan stage that I maybe could have or should have 
And that was part of the reason I wanted to do it. I, I felt like a lot of my peers were already settling down into their careers and I didn't have a clue exactly where things were going to land. And I knew that I needed to try different stuff. And so all of that kind of coalesced into the meatloaf that I ate on my way up to Alaska. And so the emotional meatloaf. And, but it didn't disappoint. In hindsight, I can tell a different story than I did at the time. I knew at the time that I just wanted an adventure and I was trusting my gut. And that's all I can really say about that. I like uncomfortable situations. I'm weird like that. I did. I trained with um, mixed martial artists pretty actively, like active fighters for about three or four years. And so that's some of the most uncomfortable stuff you can do, especially when you're new. Because I started from scratch. I didn't know anything about fighting. Most everybody that comes into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they come from wrestling. And so they at least know how to suffer with a little bit of skill and athleticism. And I was an athlete, but I just got bent in half for a year. Awful. But, then, but slowly you get bent in half slower. And then pretty soon you're like being able to bend other people a little bit. I like adventures. Awesome. I like uncomfortable situations and I like testing myself and that goes into the resilience work. I didn't know enough about resilience to know that was the process for gaining resilience at the time. Resilience comes from putting yourself in increasingly uncomfortable situations, just enough that you can handle them, but not so much that they're overwhelming, the emotional strength you're trying to grow. So you start by connecting with a mining company up there, I'm guessing then, is that the deal? Did you go work for someone or how did no, you get into the so, I had already started to lay the path for Alaska unknowingly though. I was working in media at the time. And so I was shooting and editing video, but I was working for a sales company and I had some really good opportunities to, to take some big creative swings towards like different media pieces that I was making. Like we shot a music video that was like about salespeople. So I wore like a wig and we designed it all. and. These are some of the first commercial creative pitches I'm taking. And I didn't realize that cr my creative mind had commercial value up until those moments. I just thought it was like this quirky part of me. But then all of a sudden my paycheck is linked to like my ability to just do what's fun, which is create. Like, Whoa, wow. this is crazy. But it didn't pay very well. And so I got a job in an underground mine in Eastern Utah. It was, it's called Gilsonite. It's an ore that's, it looks obsidian. But it becomes airborne in this dust. So I have pictures. In fact, it's my wife's profile picture. When I call her, a picture of me at the mine shows up on her phone. And it's me with this black dust all over my face. And you can just see like white eyes peering out from this black dust with a blue bandana to keep it out of my hair. It was rough, but I love working out there. But in answer to your question, a friend was a mutual friend of the guy that was suction dredging up a gnome. He said, you're a miner and this guy's a miner, so you guys should be friends. So he introduced us and it's like apples and fish. Like the types of mining are so different. There's almost nothing related, but it was enough to give me an introduction. And then I heard about diving and I was like, yeah, I would love to do that. I didn't even know what it meant, but I'm like, yeah, it sounds crazy. Let's do it. And so you just take it on. So you, now you're diving for gold and how does that all work? Can you just go out on a boat and big suction and dredges and stuff and yeah so they're like most of the boats in the fleet up in Nome are like party boats you know with a pontoon boat okay. and what they do up in Nome is I'll I'll do a vertical so the pontoon and then in the middle part there's all the recovery apparatus so there's a big box it's called the sluice box and then there's a water suction component which kind of looks like a vacuum it's just a big hose and there's a suction component with a, a water pump on the deck and it creates suction. So all this hose comes up from the bottom of the ocean and all the dirt and everything, and it comes through this recovery system. And then the gold sticks, the gold's really lazy. It's really heavy. It doesn't want to move. It's hard to move it. And it wants to go back to sleep the minute it can. So that's what we do. And you can make a living doing this. That's why I'm not doing it much anymore. So yeah, you can do pretty good at it. And some of it depends on the price of gold. My best years were when gold was the lowest in the last 10 years. And so I learned some really important lessons about that I'm applying every day at center camp about like costing and where the different costs of your business, where they're going, like what you're spending your money on and stuff, cash flows. But yeah, you can do okay. I have a house up there is paid for by gold. I have a bunch of tools and a couple of operating gold boats that were all paid for by gold. Wow. But I never hit the mother load though. So I'm still working. So 
Yeah. And you have some media experience already. Is that how you started filming? How did this come about creating all this content? And then also your discussion with Discovery, it sounded like. Yeah. So I had already worked on a documentary project in Africa. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just basically interviewing people over there and it was free form and I didn't really have an agenda. I was working with a nonprofit and they didn't have any agenda either. So it was this really incredible opportunity to just act like I was a media person and interview people on a really high level. So that was about a month in Uganda and Tanzania. That was in, I think, 2007. So I had a bunch of my own equipment already to be able to shoot HD TV and do something with it. And slowly I learned how to end it. And anyway, when I saw the final production that Discovery did though, I was a finger painter. Like those guys are professionals and I, I wasn't on that level. I'm very clear on that and more on that later because it informed like who I knew I needed to become. But anyway, so yeah, when I got to know him, I had a general framework of capturing video with the purpose of pitching it. I didn't even know what that meant. I'd never pitched a show. There's a very specific route that ideas come off the street and just being a normal guy, having an idea about a show, good luck with that. There's so many layers between the actual network and an idea off the street. There's so many professional layer, people getting paychecks and feeding their family because of their expertise in between a person off the street and the network. So it's just about impossible to do anymore. But yeah, at the time, the pipeline was a little bit different at the time. So I was actually able to get a pitch directly to Discovery and to, um, who is it? Original Production. They produce Ice Road Trucker, Deadliest Catch is their biggest show. They're similarly formatted. They figured out a storytelling mathematical formula and they tell that story throughout a lot of different jobs and stuff. The dramatic narration, the stakes. Yeah. I love yeah. those shows. Did you no. ever watch those shows then or did you? see the shows and you're like, hey, been there, done that. Gold Rush Alaska was one that I was fascinated with. The Hoffman's not doing well. The Schnabel's doing amazing. But just there's so many moments when you're yelling at the TV and rooting for some guys. And on top of that, I also feel like it can be tempting because you see some of these guys making crazy money. And it doesn't surprise me that people want to go up and be a crab boat fisherman or a gold miner or something. But I got to imagine it's not that easy. It doesn't look like an easy job anyway, but I, I just can't imagine that everyone goes up there and strikes gold. Sorry for the pun. No, they don't. It takes two or three years to figure out what you're doing and to be profitable. And unless you come with a big bankroll and you have enough tools and resources to actually get into it. So the year after the show released, there was a little bit of a blip in the amount of suction dredges that were up there. But then the year after that, when people had actually time to put together operations and ship it up. That was the biggest year. And it was crazy. There were a couple of times where I was diving in a public area where there were five boats around me within a hundred feet, which is actually against international law. When you have a diver down flag, you're not supposed to get within a certain distance of boats. And I had a diver down flag and, and these boats were just on top of me. I couldn't move. I wasn't on gold. It was pretty lame. Because all those people, they churn through material that you could actually make money on. They just didn't know how to run it right. And they put their tailings, like the stuff that goes through the slow box that isn't gold, they spit that out and they put that on good material. And so then you have to go through a foot and a half of material to get to that pay layer instead of six inches. And so it was really problematic. Plus they don't know how to anchor right. So when the weather kicks up, I almost got hit by a boat because they were just dragging anchor right into my boat. And anyway, there was a lot of problems with that. Luckily, the people that know how to make money up there are still up there and everybody else knows, oh yeah, it's really hard. We don't want to do that. There's a lot of easier ways to make money. Can you just sluice the tailings that the amateurs are leaving behind and find some gold that they've left behind for the next person? Usually there's not a lot of tailings or gold in the tailings, but there's gold underneath the tailings. And depending on how long someone's within a spot, there's a pile of dirt on top of the good material and pretty much every mining endeavor and whether you're talking oil or gravel or coal or anything it's all about how deep that pay layer is and how much it's going to cost you to go that deep now everything there is to know about mining then so in gold you can do the math if you have to move twice as much material for the same pay layer as over here when you move half as much material as the same pay layer the math is pretty simple on that it's just yards per hour and when things are deeper, it's just more costly. The pay layer has to be better to go deeper. Yeah. Makes sense. Oh, fascinating. But I can't imagine 
in those conditions. And I also wanted to ask you about Alaska in general, because you were up there for a long time. And I had a buddy that was, I think they call him a smoke jumper from Alaska for a while. And one of the things that yeah. he said to me was that guys don't last very long because of the long nights and the impact that the darkness takes on people, their psyche and their mentality and stuff. So I'm just kind of curious what your experience was like with that, because obviously Alaska is a popular destination for tourists in the summer. Now, I certainly would love to go. I want to get up there sometime. For the people that are around there all year long, what's that like? And does that factor into you ever leaving? I don't prefer the winter. I call it the one summer lie because I was only supposed to go up there for the summer. And then it turned into, what is it? It's, I guess, 14 years and counting that I've gone up there. Right now, I'm at half and half winters that I've stayed up there and winters that I've left. Wow. And unless you're super into snow machining, which is uh, snowmobiling, I don't know anybody that actually prefers the winter. They just do it because they have day jobs and it's just where the family is. And you, they haven't designed their life in such a way that they can snowbird yet. Most everybody that I know that is honest, they dream of snowbirding who mm. not like staying up there during the winter. But in answer to your question, it's really weird because the darkness is the other half. It's the other shoe that drops. But the first shoe that lifts is the lightness because we get 24 hours of light up in Nome for about a week stretch and it's really weird when people are walking out of the bars like stumbling at two o'clock in the morning and it's bright <laughs> outside it's totally bright it makes people look a little bit more lushy than what they would in the normal setting when you walk out of the bar at bar break and it's dark appropriately and you can go to sleep because it's dark but it's really weird the light i worked grave shifts all through school to put myself through college and so I did about three years of grade shifts, full time working, going to school full time. So I'm used to shift work. So it wasn't that big of a transition for me. I know some people in response to your smoke jumper friend, I think that'd be harder because sometimes if he's actually a smoke jumper, that likes jumping in camping, firefighting like that. He's got to stay in a tent that's hot. And when it's bright outside in the middle of summer, that's way harder than anything I ever did sleep wise. I put curtains on my windows and blacked it out. Boom. Night. Yeah. I guess I didn't think about that. The light. <laughs> yeah. So there's one thing that you have to design your life around when you're a suction dredger. You're like a fireman in the sense that you're just waiting for the bell to go off. And the bell is the wind in the ocean. Wind causes waves and waves make it so you can't dive. And so we, like most of my friends up there, we geek out on weather apps, just looking for any weather window that'll give us six or seven hours of calm that we can go out and dive. So you just plan your life accordingly. And there was a year, the one was 2014 and 2015, I ran a 24 hour crew. And so we were constantly looking for that six to 10 hour window. So sometimes we wouldn't find out that the next day it was going to calm down by three in the morning. We wouldn't find that out until seven or eight at night. And then we'd instantly get a nap. We'd be up at two o'clock, get down to the boat by 2.30, 2.45, drop an anchor by 3.30 in the morning. It's a really hard way to live, man. It's a really hard way to make money. We had a decent year compared to other boats, but that was a really bad weather year. And the only reason we basically broke even was because we were willing to make those sacrifices of sleep. So it's hard. Uh, the light it's really hard. You just have to make that commitment. Yeah. And a business owner. So you're up in Alaska, you're making your fortune with gold and then does the pandemic hit? How does the transition here to center cam happen? Seems like a big jump to go from mining to tech all of a sudden. I still died, but just to be really clear, I have friends that are full-time divers. And this last summer I was working on a, a gold diving project, but I didn't get a lot of time in the water. I love the lifestyle and I love doing that, but I've also become real clear that it's a pretty niche industry and it's not as big of an idea as I would like to be a part of. I guess that's part of it. I feel like me personally, I have a lot more to offer the, the, the world than dive hours. I've made the same decision. The world is not going to be better by me diving. Yeah, then you made it a lot faster. You're a much smarter individual than I am. It took me like 10 years to come to that conclusion. But I don't know. I feel like I learned the things that I needed to learn, but financially, I just eked out an existence. I never really made a ton of money at it. I was able to pay for the operation, pay for tools that I needed. I've got a house up there now. It's humble, but it's mine. Paid for it with gold. That's all cool, but I wanted to be a part of different stuff. And you know, Noah was on the edge of the civilization. And I love Nome as a town, but I wanted to be involved in different stuff. And so I started to pivot probably about 
four years ago or so from trying to be a full-time gold diver to being a gold diver with other stuff going on. And was going the entrepreneurial route the only option for you? Did you want to be in business for yourself again in the next endeavor? Or how did it, how did you decide to do that? Because the entrepreneur life is not necessarily an easy existence either, right? No, it's not. I bounced in and out of day jobs throughout my entire professional career, but the goal was always to run my own business and have the discipline that it requires to run my own business. And because like you said, it's not easy. I just read an article about the CEO of NVIDIA Mm. and it's really fascinating, but he says that if he'd known what it would take to build the company, he never would have done it. He'd be insane to want to go through what he's had to go through. And it really hit a chord with me because before Center Camp started, and I mentioned that at the beginning of the podcast, I've had a lot of failures and I've had some successes too. It's not like it's just been like one string of failure, but I've tried so many different things and I've learned so much, but I've had so many misfires that when Center Cam came along, I thought we were onto something. But now that I know what I know by looking in hindsight at the journey that Center Cam's taken to get to the day that we're at today, it is insane that anyone would choose without not being under duress, like with a gun to their head, the entrepreneurial path. Like you have to have so many things in line. If you're with a partner, you have to have a supportive partner. They've got to be aligned with what it's going to take, like the emails you're going to be answering with international suppliers at one and two in the morning, just to make sure that you don't lose two or three days because of cross communication. They're going to need to know that for a couple of months, we may be running on fumes in our bank account, just as we need to reallocate resources to make sure the company can move forward into growth. There's so much risk associated with it. It's crazy. In hindsight, I know that I couldn't be any other way. And I know this is the path that I need to go. But at the time, I was just following my gut and following the energy. And I've had day jobs that were fairly compelling, but they didn't have anything for me. There's meaning involved in them. I was helping people, paying my bills with them. But I had this whole dream world in my mind of things, possibilities I wanted to try to make real in the world that it became a situation where I was almost like crawling out of my skin at this day job. And I didn't know that I needed to follow it. So I was like having this war with myself. No, but stability and risk, you need to avoid the risk. And I finally had to just lean into the energy and pursue the things that were challenging and a little bit scary. And that's how we are where we are. And now that I know enough about the process of learning and resilience, I don't know that I could be any other way now, but for a while there was touch and go. It was like, Huge identity crisis for like a decade, man. It was hard for me. I'm not sure why it was so hard for me, but it was pretty hard. I hear what you're saying, Ian. I feel like we're kindred spirits on it because I've had a few businesses in the past and I worked in financial services. So I had good, steady employment and I was just trying to do things on the side. And one of the things that I tell people usually when they say, Hey, I want to start a business or I want to become an entrepreneur or I want to quit my job. I say, that's great. As long as you don't need the money. Because I think the one thing that <laughs> entrepreneurs do or assume is that the money is the easy part. I see a lot of people going out and saying, look at how big the industry is. Look how big this market segment is. And just like, you know, if I open the doors, all this business is going to come my way. And it's just not that way. It's you got to grind it out. The NVIDIA story. I totally agree. There are so many things that I looked back on myself because they were filled. I had some businesses that I shut down and I put countless hours and all of my money into it. But I think the advantage of that is you get better the next time. Like you said, I don't look at where the overburden is 10 feet. I look where it's five feet. And then you start figuring out how to get to the one foot. And so you're better and sharper because of that in the next one. And in hindsight, I wish, well, I'd be great if I were starting something now. It took those 10 years. It took that decade of cutting my teeth on learning the hard lessons the other way to get me there. But I also see the allure of getting into business because when you have a great product, a great idea, it can make a big difference. And I guess in some ways, COVID hitting was probably a little bit of a boon for you because now you're recognizing some of the problems, right? People working virtually and going offline and working from home and doing web conferences, all this stuff really blossomed out of COVID, to be honest. Even the software we're using for this recording here. I just remember tech companies trying to roll out, like needing software so quickly. And it was just, as you said, 
It was just so bad. Looking up people's noses because they had their laptop webcam pointed up their face. It just seemed like there was a better way. And you end up seeing kind of the same problem and end up coming up with center cam, we'll call it version one which I think I supported back at the time and got and used. And I was really excited about it because I thought it was a great idea. And I thought the product worked very well. And now you come out with version two and I fell in love with center cam too. And I think we both are using the center cams. And that's probably why we look like we're talking to each other, looking at each other, because I've got it right there. And I just love this product because I just don't understand. Maybe it's one of these hindsight things, but after you use it, you wonder, how was this not around forever before? It's like one of those obvious things, like the Shark Tank pitches where you're like, how did I not think of something like that? But I want to ask you about that. So now you're on version 2.0. You are making connections for people that can't do it in person. What's been the journey to Center Cam 2 and what makes you excited about this latest version here? So we wanted Center Cam to before center cam one, but you can only start where you are. And so I reached out to a bunch of different manufacturers and I'm literally starting in the basement of my friend's house. Cause I don't have a presence down here in Utah. I was single at the time I'm finishing up a master's degree. And then my intention had been to go back to Alaska with a master's degree and continue my life up there. So I'm in a basement, COVID hits, we switched to remote. I'm finishing up like a documentary project. That was my capstone project. And just so much is going on. And then this problem comes across my desk and it's really weird. I've had lots of ideas for different inventions throughout the course of my life, but I was at a point of my life where I became clear that I need to finish things. I can't just have ideas anymore. I had a couple of business partnerships that we kept on talking about what we were doing instead of doing them. And I was just tired of that. And so I created this kind of inertia storm where I had to do it or I wouldn't be who I thought I was. And the idea for Center Cam hit right at that time. I, I have another business partner. He's my business partner on Center Cam. His name's Brian. He's such a good dude. But we spoke about three or four different products that we were thinking about launching. Center Cam became part of the conversation and I had been pursuing it independently. And he was like, why don't you work on that? And so we did. And so we found the most readily available, smallest USB enabled camera that we could find. In the process, we reached out to 20, 30 suppliers from the PCB up, other types of cameras, already shipping small USB enabled cameras, stuff like that. We found one that was close to what we wanted and then we tweaked it. And I was learning on the fly, man. It was ready, fire, aim stuff. I was like, hey, I wonder if this will work. Let's try it. And so we got a camera and I'll be damned. There were a lot of things that needed to change on it, but I'll like it worked. And he was very clear that we were onto something. And I felt the way that you feel about center cam and I'm the owner. Like it just felt weird that I'm the guy solving this problem. It really did. And that's not a knock on the industry or anything. My mom loves me and I have a healthy self esteem and everything, but it was really weird. It still is honestly, like we're so far down the rabbit hole now that we're experts at what we do and we know how and why we're doing it. And there aren't many like accidental things that happen anymore, but. At the time, I was just waiting for one of the big companies to come out with one because it made sense and it didn't really make a lot of sense that we we're solving this problem. But then the farther along we got, especially after the launch, it's like, oh my gosh, we're on the top of the wave here. Like we've caught it and there's no other surfers in the water right now. This is Here's insane. Here. Still, you're going Still, to town, yeah. as far as I know. I want to ask you about the miniature. There, there are a couple of competitors that have done direct knockoffs. One of them has actually modified it a little bit. We have patent protection on our delivery method, like our clip, and then our camera body plus clip both have design patents. So we have a little bit of protection on our configuration. So there are other ways to deliver the camera to the middle of the screen. There's so many things that I love about this idea. And one of the things that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is how do you get it so small? Because I have tried probably hundreds of web cameras over the years. And some are good and some are bad, but one thing is consistent. They're big, they're large, they're pretty bulky. Even if they don't have a ring light, you know, some of them are so decked out with stuff that they have to be big, but some are just cameras and they're still this big. I've got one that I'm not sure how you'd mount because it's gotta be a pound and a half. And so how do you get the resolution and the fidelity and the image with what looks like to be the size of my pinky? that camera and you've got the camera and the, all the tech in there. 
And so I'm just curious, how's your camera literally one twentieth the size of all the other webcams in my office? Which, it's witchcraft. And there you have it, folks. <laughs> That's just way off in the distance. It looks small from here. Just, on a serious note, one of the limitations of our product, and it doesn't show up very often, but if you have a lot of stuff going on in the background with your computer, center cam won't perform quite as well. And the reason for that is that we don't have onboard processing. So some of the bigger webcams, some of the cheaper ones don't, they just have a big camera body because they're trying to approximate some of the, the good webcams that are screen edge webcams, but they don't actually have onboard processing. They don't have very good hardware. They have a great plastic body with a bunch of crap inside. So those are like the generic webcams. When you get into some of the upper end webcams that you can get, they have onboard processing. They have stereo mics instead of mono mics. We have a mono mic. It doesn't make sense to have two microphones right next to each other. That's not stereo. So they're able to create stereo. But what that onboard processing does, it allows them to be able to process light slightly differently than what CenterCam does. CenterCam relies on some of the processing power of the computer, but it's not dedicated yet. That's where we're going from a technical standpoint is figuring out a way to do that. So we have some of that extra capability that the strainage webcams do. But yeah, that's basically it. We're relying on the computer's processing power and some of the bigger webcams have actual processing power on board. That's part of what their size is. But frankly, some of it isn't. They don't need to be as big as they are. It's just a package. And it's really weird. I had this thought. So the whaling industry, thank goodness for the oil industry, because before we were burning oil, we were burning whales. That's technologically, that was part of what happened. And as soon as we figured out how to burn petroleum for light instead of whales. Electricity was right around that time too, but like all of a sudden, and I might even be getting my history wrong. Anyway, the whaling industry, it just ceased to exist overnight. When people realize, oh, that's not a good way to do it. There's a better way to do it. We're so accustomed to what screen edge webcams are that we've allowed ourselves to think that this look is okay or that look is okay in a video conference. And it's really weird. It's like taking the blue pill. Center cam is like taking the blue pill or the red pill, whatever pill it is that creates enlightenment. It's that. Because all of a sudden when you're at a video conference and people are having that view, like you can't look at them the same anymore. And when you have the opportunities to bring your notes in right here and still look like you're looking and, and not have that bad view. So I think we're just waiting on that inertia, that tipping point before people realize, yeah, the video input actually matters and this is a better way to do it. And it's fairly obvious. So we're just waiting for that. And I don't know if that's something that you're going to have in your podcast, man, but for me to you, it's, it's been really weird that to look at a problem, get it out there, realize, yeah, I think this is the solution here. And then to still have everybody accepting like a really bad look, it's really weird, but here we are. It'll be in there. Well, and it's not just the web meetings to me. What is brilliant about this is especially when we all had to work remotely, is that it's not just meetings, it's trainings. How many times have I done a computer-based training where the person is recording themselves with it, but again, looking off to their screen that they're demoing on instead of looking here, or obviously reading off a script that is on their screen over here. To me, you can't expect the average consumer to have a teleprompter at home and a studio set up and all these other things. But the center cam beauty is that it can do pretty much all of that stuff in one device that's cheaper than most of the other webcams out there. And that's what kind of blows my mind about it, because now I could do trainings, I can do webinars, and it's just so much more immersive. I can pull up my Word doc and put it right behind the center cam and read it. Those were real problems. I, I have literally clipped my papers up by my webcam before. When I was trying to yeah. read a script for a video or for training or something like that, and you see those eyes dart all over the place, but it's the best that you can do. But now you can do so much more. And to me, the camera really disappears. Like I'm looking at you because, and probably because you're looking at me as far as I can tell. Yeah. And it's just the camera right off to the side of your face there. And so to me, it's just a, a brilliant design and it's really small. Like I said, I have tried other things that put the camera, like you said, in the middle of the screen, but they're pretty big and bulky. And one of the things that I've noticed too, is that I'm going to always remove those. There's no second thought that once I'm done with it, it's going off to the side because they're big. They take up a lot of screen. Since I've clipped the center cam to my monitor, I have not moved it. And now sometimes if it's right on a word or something, I'll move it. Exactly. But the nice yeah. thing about it is 
I've got it set up the way I want it generally. And now I don't have to touch it because of how small it is. It's such a unique advantage. And again, technology might be Star Trek in the future where they're just looking at the screen. There doesn't seem to be a camera. Everyone's got great eye contact. So maybe we'll all have those terminals in the future or cameras behind the, the screen. But I love what you're doing. Can I ask you one other question about the new center cam? There is also sure. a new color way, I believe. There's a white center cam version too, as well. Ooh, yeah. yeah. So what's the story behind that? We're leading the dance here. And so there's certain decisions that a company makes based on feedback and focus groups and things like that. But there's also certain decisions, you, a good company that is breaking ground like we are. I think we're a good company anyway. You just have to make decisions based on what it is. And no one can tell us. We've asked people that would know and no one can tell us black camera or white camera, what's going to be the least obtrusive on a screen. That information isn't out there. It's certainly not red and it's certainly not blue. So we figure either black or white or probably the either. And then people can make their own decision. So that was what we're trying to do. But frankly, it's a big experiment to see what people go for, what people like. We're going to use that information and put it in. Who knows? 3.0 might be all white or it might be all black based on a massive failure that white is. I don't know. We're not sure. I use both and I have enough screens that are black and enough white that I, I don't notice a huge difference, but I'll be interested to get that feedback from our customers. Because it's not something I really thought about until I saw it on your launch page, but it makes a lot of sense to me because I think there are a lot of people that like dark mode or light mode. I'm a light mode kind of guy, I like bright. Yeah. It's really easy for me to read, but I have some friends that swear by dark everything, which just speaks to their soul as well. It's everything yeah. flagged out. And so when I thought about that, even though the camera is not obtrusive, it is this little black line. And usually what I have are a lot of bright screens. And when I saw the white, I thought, man. Again, it's the genius thinking on your part that I think that would probably disappear better on my setup, but my buddy's setup that always goes dark mode on everything, he'd probably be sold on the black camera. There'll probably never be a second thought about it. So I think it's a great, it's probably a small innovation on your side, but just it's providing value, I think, to the users in that small way that makes the camera, which is already small, even less obtrusive. So. I appreciate that. It, it's really interesting. Like this far down the rabbit hole, we have experience with doing certain things and we know what it means. When you have two inventory cues, like two different identical products, but they're different model, like a color or there's different types of specs, but it's the same kind of base. Like that splits your inventory. And as a small company with Indiegogo, we were offering a 52 degree field of view lens and a 65 degree field of view lens for our customers. And so right out of the gate, we just did it the hardest way possible. And we're like, okay, here's two options. Instead of just one and telling people what they were going to get, we offered two choices and then we had to split inventory and it just creates the different paths in the choose your own adventure story. And it was really hard. It was a hard way to do that. So this time around, we know what we're getting into and we offer two choices and we're actually in a position to be able to do it instead of just like, figuring it out on the fly like we did last time. If you're ever going to start a business, don't offer many choices. Just offer one. Just make it simple. There's so many difficult parts of starting a business. Just offer one choice. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. Then see if it hits. That's my advice. Oh my, That's my unsolicited advice. We can handle white and black. We're going to have a couple of different model cameras coming down in the next year. And then we're not planning on a completely sunsetting version one. It has use scenario. There's a lot of use cases where version one is a great camera for people. It has a different type of focus than the fixed focus lens. Like you can do a macro focus yeah. on it, so you can focus it up to three inches. So in the digital document space, if people want to, it would be great for that. Or in the, like, the medical diagnostic space, if you wanted to really focus in on the rash or something, I don't do it every day, but people do. People are into Well, that. you're making me think, geez, maybe people should have multiple center cams, almost like a, a downward looking center cam where I can show a document <laughs> underneath a physical document and still have my center cam for the, the face interaction. And I think it's a, it's just a brilliant product. I've been using it for the past couple of weeks now or whatever it is. And it's just a seamlessly integrated with everything I've got. It doesn't move around. I really love it. I'm stoked to hear that the company's moving, doing well, innovating. And so congratulations to you for uh, sticking through it. What's next for the business and for you guys? I've got a really good team working on it. I actually spent a lot of the summer on a gold diving project. So I was building a boat that 
could have hydraulic wheels under it so it could drive up on the beach. Oh. And it was like, yeah, that's how I feel about it. That's what my wife also feels about it. It's what are you doing? But I knew it was a really cool ride, but that was like outside of everything. I think the gold bugs out of my system, honestly. I, I really love how we do what we do up there, but I'm actually conducting therapy. I'm a full-time therapist right now. And as far as center cam goes, it's something that I'm doing on the side. I have a really good team. And because my intention was never to become a tech guy. My intention was to help people connect. That's what my life is devoted to. The social work that you so, did, this is really just enabling more social interaction between people. Yeah. So I, it makes a lot of sense. And I really feel like that's a common thread between entrepreneurs is it's not about starting a business. It's about solving a problem. It's about addressing yeah. some sort of need. And that's when things work out. Because if it's just about making money, you could play lotto or just get a high paid job and work two shifts or whatever you want to do. But I appreciate you sticking through it. And it's one of those things I love too, is people that are making things happen are sometimes the guys just grinding it out in your buddy's basement and making things really happen. What about ever merging with a big camera manufacturer or something? Would you ever consider that taking this in-house under a bigger brand? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think our tool can help people connect better. And I would love that to be the case. One of the biggest questions that's driving our business right now is how to get outside of the circles we've already contacted. And because we know we barely scratched the surface on people that need our product. And so how do we get way outside of the people we're marketing to right now? So absolutely, I would love to do that. Like I said, my intention was never to become like a tech bro. My intention was to solve a problem that hit me personally. And I think is a compelling way to use my life, which is like to help people connect. We're online. We're in it's going to get more so as the years go by, like remote work is going to be more and more normal. And so how do we create that connection with people? Because there is something that is lost when we're in Zoom conferences, not looking at each other. There's parts of being human that have to be there and for us to feel meaning, to feel happiness. And when we're completely disconnected and disjointed, it leads to like really bad outcomes. So. All of that being said, it's been a really awesome problem to solve. And the fact that we've helped connect so many people, it's like a dream come true, man. Like I feel very humbled and very grateful for all of that. And there's a lot of work to do, but yeah, absolutely. We could accelerate that process by partnering with the right brand that actually sees the vision, wants to push the gas on it. We'd love to partner with that person or brand, whatever. But Center Cam 1 is still available to people. That's, That's correct. Right? Center Cam 2 coming yep. soon to folks. They support it on the end Yeah, April. We're planning on shipping in April. That was a really conservative date. We're hoping to beat that date by a little bit, but yeah. I appreciate you allowing me to have a early look at it. It's kind of everything that I hoped it would be. To me, it's polished final product. As far as I can tell, it works great. I am not a techie by any means. I like being able to plug things in and just get them to work. And obviously, I think for a lot of people, you can go in and tweak settings and download software and do all sorts of things you want. But for me, it was just so nice to be able to get back to the things that I wanted to do, connecting with people, having meetings. And in some ways it's changing what I'm doing because I have a teleprompter that I use for trainings and stuff. But a lot of that is now happening at my desk because I can do it with the center cam. Good on you for bringing it, man. I can't thank you enough. I'm telling you. If Thanks so much. People think they're getting by with their webcams now. Yeah. Stop suffering see the light, get one of these, try it out. Like, wh What's the price point on the center cam V2? 95 bucks. Under a hundred bucks. I think that's actually a fraction of some of the web that I have. I've got an Elgato face cam over there and I think it was like 299 bucks or something. So anyway, I just think it's great. Thanks so much for connecting with me. <laughs>